Welcome to the In Live Live Conversations podcast with Amy Parker and Cheryl Dunn. By tuning in, you are joining a community that will inspire you to increase balance, wellness, and joy in your life. We will offer expert information and insightful conversations to help us all on our journey to live more in vibe. For more information and articles, remember to also check out our website at inviblife.com. That's E-N-V-I-B-E-L-I-F-E.com. We're grateful that you are here. Hi, welcome to InVibe Life Conversations with Amy Parker and Cheryl Dunn. We have a little bit different setup today. If you're looking at the video, I'm on my own and Cheryl is at a remote location with her hubby, Stephen Dunn, who is joining us as our guest today. So hi, Stephen, and thank you both for signing in this morning from afar. Howdy, howdy. So, uh Stephen, our special repeat guest. Four Today feet. is four, four, four time on yes. this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he always is like, what are you asking of me now? <laughs> what are we talking about today? <laughs> today, we came to Stephen and Amy and I, um, what's been kind of pinging us is injury prevention. So we know it's that time of year, the weather's changing, people are getting out, they're getting more active, they're doing things that they necessarily weren't doing on their couch during the winter. And that therefore is sometimes a recipe for, you know, all the things that you're seeing. So tell us what you're seeing and what we can do to help prevent that when it's this time of year when maybe we were more sedentary, but we're getting more active. Got it. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. First of all, guys, it's always a pleasure. Um, and uh, we, we think we've got our dogs worked out to where they're not going to go crazy <laughs> and barking, and, you know, but we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, injury prevention is kind of an interesting thing. Um, I actually don't really know if I believe in the world, word injury prevention. And I'll explain why. Um, if you watch the professional athletes who put in more work than anybody, they get injured every week. Yeah, that's um, true. I was watching the uh, Super Bowl the other day, and um, Odell Beckham uh, re-tore his ACL. They haven't confirmed that, but I'm positive he re-tore his ACL for the second time on that knee with, uh, with just trying to stop. He was just trying to stop. Nobody touched him, no contact. It was a non-contact. The field got him. I actually did a YouTube video on it and broke it down. And then if we look at the national championship for uh, football – uh, the Alabama receiver, same thing happened. Uh, Williams, uh, Jameson Williams, I believe is his name. Um, he was just running and he, and he cut to go basically plant this foot and turn a different way. And his, his uh, knee tore up just like that. And nobody touched him. It was just them cutting, them stopping. And these guys are elite athletes. I'm talking they train and they put in the work. So I, I don't know if injury prevention is really real um, because I don't think you can pre- prevent getting injured when in certain situations. Now, most people are not elite athletes playing in the Super Bowl, playing in the national championship game. You're kind of making me feel a little better right now. <laughs> so, I was like, he didn't tell me this is where he was going. No, I thought we were talking about no, like, but, 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 I, but that's, you know, that's um, when you watch people that you know put in the work, they're still getting yeah. injured. So I just want to say that, but that's an elite people. That's, that's elite athletes that, you know, they make millions of dollars to put in the work. So have that, a whole that, team of people watching out for them, training uh, them. hundred yeah. percent. Nutrition. Everything. Everything. All of it. everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I you know just kind of throwing a curveball to start, but that's, that's truly my thought. So we can do everything we can to minimize the risk of injury but prevention of injury, just, I don't know, just, it's just a word that's, I'll, I'll say it this way too, from a standpoint of like a business owner, marketing injury prevention, ain't nobody buying. So no, no one's buying until they're actually injured. Um, so that's one thing I will say from a standpoint of business, um, anyone mar- uh, marketing injury prevention is probably not doing very much business with that marketing pitch. So just to throw y'all off a little bit. <laughs> But anyway, Welcome to my life. when you have, but when you have been hurt, 
then you do start thinking about how can I keep this or from, from happening, happening again it, if it, I can. Exactly. Yeah. So, so let me go to the original question. Um, Cheryl was talking about, you know, this that time of year where people are going out and getting active and when things typically do get, people do get hurt. So now we're just talking about the everyday person, the people that mm-hmm. I treat in my practice, the, the people that Cheryl trains, the, the people that are listening to this podcast, mm-hmm. a lot of average everyday people, maybe they, they're weekend warriors and that's a part of their injuries that they're going to sustain. But anyway, when you've, when you've been kind of a, maybe lazy over the, the winter and then all of a sudden it's time to get active again. Uh, most people, they don't ramp up. They just jump yeah, yeah. all in. And that's, I think the reason people get injured the most is that they go all or nothing and they think they're back to where they were six months ago. And the older you get, you still think like, you know, I'm almost 50 and I still think I'm 25. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's that side of it from a mentality standpoint. Um, and I don't know that we'll change that with people. Um, the thing is, is if we can just get people to kind of slow down and start from a kind of elementary and build instead of going right back to what they think they could do, what they used to do, or what was normal for them 10 years ago, because really 10 years ago seems like yesterday. Right. Um, so I I think it's important to ramp up. There's actually a lot to this because I mean, okay. So first of all, just from that point, that 10 years ago seems like yesterday, it does kind of sneak up on you. Or, you know, now being in my fifties, I know that I feel like I've had a couple big jumps where there were differences, you know, probably sometime around the age 40, there was a big difference in my body sometime around the age. And I had some health problems then too. So there was that around the age 50, I kind of started seeing a little bit of a difference but you know, if you still feel pretty good and like you have good vitality, you think I can go out there. I can still do it. I should be able to do this. I know Cheryl, you and I have talked before and I'll be like, I'm on the mountain trying to ski, looking at these people my age or older. And I think, well, if they're doing it, I should be able to. And you've told me, you don't know what their injuries are or were though. You're just seeing them that one day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe they're there every day and maybe they live yeah. at the mountain and they do it 35 times a season and they're, they're trained. That's what they do. Um, and you go once every three years. That's a, uh, you can't compare those. Those, those aren't, aren't fair comparisons. Or maybe they're suffering through the injury. So I do, I do think there's a difference as you get older that you have to give yourself a little bit of grace for your body is different. But the other thing I think that Cheryl, you know, you started by saying it's that time of year. I don't think it's just that time of year because I think whenever you've been in a slump, then when you start again, maybe you've gained a little weight or you're a little out of shape or you just don't feel as good. So your tendency is I'm going to just hit it hard for two or three weeks and then I can make up for that lost time. And that can be any time of year, really not just. Right. I completely agree with you. I think, especially as women, There'll mm-hmm. be times all throughout the year that we have that decision. Like you're I about think, to go on spring break to somewhere yeah, you're going to be wearing that, a bikini. <laughs> yeah, that's whatever. what I was like. It's almost <laughs> swimsuit season. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and what's funny is that I hear it in the studio. Like people uh-huh. come in, oh, it's, it's going to be swimsuit season. Can we do this or can we do that? You know, something that we don't normally do. And, um, but, you know, and I'm a victim of that. Yeah. I definitely you know, feel like, oops, start to wear in shorts pretty big, pretty soon. So, you know, let's go get that spray tan. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the mo- most important things when people are getting back to it, especially if they've had injuries in the past, is to respect those injuries and know that there's a good chance of flaring them up. And that's where, you know, people that have a history of injuries, they need to have a team in place. Like, like if I'm going to start going and and pushing things, then I need to know who I'm going to see in situations that might arise. But the reality is is people should see me for a tune-up before they actually start that process. Mm -hmm. See me or, you know, whoever it is that they work with, that that they get results with, um, whether it be a chiropractor or a massage massage therapist. Yeah, I'm not not saying it has to be a physical therapist or me specifically, but I mean, if someone is... um, starting a routine and let's say they've been like kind of lethargic on the couch for the holidays, eating more than normal. And it's that like January rush of like, let's get active again. Um, 
that's a perfect time for me to spend a few sessions or if someone working on them a few sessions while they start that journey. And then like two weeks into that journey, that'd be a great time to go get a massage, to do some recovery work. So most, again, most people wait till they're already injured to seek my help. That's why injury prevention is just a weird word for me, even though I've always felt like people would gravitate towards that word. The more I've learned and the older I get, the more they, I realize they, they don't. People don't take action until something's pulled from them. Like, like I can no longer play tennis. I can no longer play golf. Now I'm going to take that action. But to say, I want to get better at golf, so I'm going to push it in the gym. No one's thinking about the body work or the alignment work or the recovery work until it's till it's there. Um, so I don't know how to I don't know how to get it in the head of people that the importance of of doing risk management work is, but it's it's hard and it it's um, it's not the common way for us to do it. Now we talk about those elite athletes as they prepare for sports they're working their butt off and they're working in every direction. They're working multi-plane. Um, you know, they're not just doing like simple exercise routines. They're doing very advanced. Now, do they get lazy with it? Sure. I'm sure they do, but they're also getting paid millions of dollars to do their thing. I think it was Kevin Durant. I saw a video the other day and he, he broke his ankle and um, you know, do you think Kevin Durant went into that game out of shape Right. Lazy, no. Yeah. no, no, none of those things. Mm-hmm. No, he went in as or a, ill prepared. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And injuries are just going to happen. But but the more we prepare for them, the better we're going to handle them. And that's just what's lacking out there. Well, and for those people like me, right? There might be a little bit of reality missing too sometimes because, like, I do a lot of exercises from videos or now streaming services, things like that. And you're watching these people and thinking, oh, well, if she's doing it, I should be able to do it. Or maybe she looks, you know, less in shape than I am. But the reality is those are professional athletes too (laughs) that you're seeing in those videos. And in my case, probably half my age. And I need to be realistic about what they're doing versus where I need to modify or it's okay to take a break or things like that. Yeah, that's definitely true. And and I find, um, you know, I exercise for a living, right? Mm-hmm. So I can do more than what my clients can do. And I have to often remind them mm-hmm. that, you know, don't compare yourself to me. Look, look at what I'm doing on a daily basis. You're coming in and seeing me once a week, right? But then at the same point, sometimes I think that people have this misconception that because of what we do with the physical therapy and the Pilates and the gyrotonic and, you know, and I can do all these things that they're like, Whoa, how does that happen? They think that I never experience any pain or Or injury. injury. Yeah. And that's not the case. You know, it's sometimes it's like when I have somebody that's so down on themselves, I have this back pain and I've had it for so long and, it's all flared up and oh no. And then there's this downward mental spiral of it. And I have to say, Hey, guess what? My left side's chronically tight. And and there are nights that it wakes me up and I have to flip from side to side because my hips hurt. And there are times that like, you know, I have to explain to them that I'm managing my own pain as well. Right. And if that's just where I think the steps of recovery come in, Mm -hmm. because we have this thing. Yeah. We have this thing in our office and we, and it's this grid and it's the four steps of recovery and you probably can explain it. Better. I, will. I will. Explain it because this is. So, yeah. And so like, um, and, and this kind of ties a, a lot of what we're talking about. That's a good point. Um, there's four basic stages of recovery based on the research that's been done in the, in the physical therapy world. And it's basically the percentage, you know, it's a graph, you know, on this side is the percentage of improvement up to hundred percent. And over here, it's the number of visits that is on average that it takes to get there, uh, physical therapy visits. And each stage is broken up one, two, three, four. And stage one is all about getting out of pain. So you're hurting. It's all about getting that inflammation down and doing things to calm the nervous system so that you can actually feel better, sleep through the night, and then actually get to step two. 
And then step two is where we started improving your mobility, improving your strength. And, and I'm not talking about sports at this point. I'm just talking about day-to-day functional things. And then that's stage one to stage two. And stage one is typically around six visits that it takes to get someone through stage one. And then around uh, visit six to seven into like visit nine, nine or 10 is like stage two of, again, getting restored range of motion, strength. And then stage three is from like visit nine up to like visit 14 or something like that. And stage three is like getting people back to golf, getting people back to tennis, getting people back to riding their bike, doing those things that aren't day-to-day like functioning, reaching into the cabinet and, you know, washing my hair, but things that are important for people to um actually be active in this life right and then stage four is that like okay i've put all that together and stage four is now the injury prevention stage the maintenance the wellness and so for us stage one two three is with me or andy the pt and stage four is with our trainers but when people are in stage three we're already starting to share them and it's about it's a situation where Stage three, I might see someone once a week and Cheryl once a week. But in stage four, they're going to be working with Cheryl exclusively. And then they're going to pop back in on my schedule when they're injured back at stage one. And the more they're in stage four, when they pop back into stage one, the easier it is to get them back to stage four. Yeah. Most people, they finish stage one and they're done. And they feel better. Their pain is better. So they stop. They stop going. And then they rely on streaming services, YouTube, to actually do the strengthening phase. And then they're back sooner than they should be because they didn't—they actually never went through those four stages. So I think those four stages are very, very important. And I actually like try to talk my patients through those on the very first visit. Or I discuss it, I lay it out. And then the three or four visits, five visits, six visits later, when they're like, man, I'm feeling great. I, I think I'm done. I'm like, okay, buddy, we're just to stage one. We're, we're now moving into stage two and, and guess what happens in stage two? The treatment's very different. It's not so much a ah, passive uh, myofascial release. It's now more like we're getting moving. We're on the equipment. We're starting to work on things. And so again, I think it's like Cheryl said, if we, if we finish those, those four stages, then we're doing much better and we stay in stage four, like, yeah. All the oh, time. All the time. And that's what I tell people when they're talking about when I'm explaining that, guess what? I was where you were, but now I live in four because of my work that I do. And you right? chose that work because, because of, of your it. history of pain. Yes. And it's not like you became a Pilates instructor to say, hey, look at me. I'm a Pilates instructor. No. It, it, was, it was like, was this is what helped me. Yeah. This is how I can help you with the same thing. Well, also Madonna was doing Pilates back then. <laughs> I mean, I know that was 20 years ago. But like... <laughs> Girl, did you want to be like a virgin? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Ooh, we digress quickly. Sorry about that. Okay. So another thing that came up to me when you were talking earlier, Stephen, are there certain types of sports or exercise that, well, the two of you really, this is a question for, see more frequently cause injuries? Like, like, like causing I injuries? Mean, yeah. Like, do you see when people come in, you're like, oh, you were doing burpees, weren't you? Or you were playing golf again, weren't you? You know I mean? Is there something out there that is more prone than others? Well, that's a great question. Like my basketball players that I see, I expect it to be a rolled ankle. And in their mind, they think they're going to be back tomorrow and they're not. Um, so that's a real common thing. Like, and again, those guys, as soon as they're out of stage one, they're done. And they're the ones that need the most into stage two, three, and four is all as, as, as anybody else. Um, for me personally, the athletes that I've seen have been all across the board um, from rowers to bowlers. I mean, I had a kid who was in a bowling club and um, that was kind of neat. He was like six, six and tall and about a hundred pounds. And uh, so he was really weak to be throwing his bowling ball, but it, it was back pain for him. Uh, I've worked with several linemen, like football linemen, and this usually neck pain because they're making contact with their head and, 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 and this position really hyperextended. Um if it's like a, um, a sport, like a, um, if it's a, a football player, that's like a, um, skilled player, like not a lineman, like a, a running back or a, um, quarterback, 
cornerback, those are usually like knee injuries and shoulder injuries. So there's definitely like patterns that I see um, that are, that are kind of common to, to the student athlete, but then there's the patient that comes in that's played tennis and they have tennis elbow and they think it's just the tennis elbow. That's the problem. And it's really the, the whole line and the whole structure and excuse me, and way more into uh, way more involved than that. So I don't really see like one thing of one sport. I see a bunch of different sports. I mean, I see like, I got a kid now he's a punter. And like that's the first punter I've ever worked with. Um, what about you had a violinist? Yes, I had. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and 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 in the community that we live in, like you know, everybody does something really good, and it might not be baseball, football, basketball. It might not be the tradition. It's usually not necessarily the traditional sports. So I've seen people that do all things. Like when I first moved to the area, there was a kid that was rowing, and I was like, "You're on the rowing team?" Like I'm like. What you, like hi a canoe, <laughs> you know, like you know, I'm from the swamp. But I don't, I never seen, I never seen Spalding <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was confused, and he showed me what he was doing. I was like, wait, what? And so, like, me and Cheryl actually went out and took five lessons on the skull. It was humbling because I was like, <laughs> if I'm going to help this kid, I need to know what he's doing. Because like, if someone it's comes in, it's a down, bigger sport in Austin now. Actually, to- yeah. totally, totally. And, and this was many, many years ago. And, and once I went out and did it on the water and felt it, I, it was not something I was going to continue doing, but I did <laughs> enjoy it. It was cool. Um, but I was able to help him because I could reproduce on my Pilates equipment and gyrotonic equipment what he was doing on the rowing, exactly what he was doing. So we could fix his shoulder problem and then repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly getting stronger in that. So I, I've seen all kinds of things. Um, and it's, 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 it's been a very interesting mix um, of, of really. Hi, it's Amy. If you're enjoying the content you're hearing on this podcast, then Cheryl and I hope that you'll go check out our website at invibelife.com. On the website, you will find tons of articles, our archive podcast, links to our social media, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, all where you can find more information on curating the life you most want in order to live in vibe. We hope you'll check it out. Yeah. And so once they get to me and we're doing the exercise part, I think most of the people that I work with are what I see. So my people are in stage four, right? It's um, golf. Golf is the biggest. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. It's in. Uh, I you can really see. torque your body. I can, you know, <laughs> as we've talked about on the podcast before. And of course, you both know lower back pain and well, actually back pain up and down my spine yes. is an issue for me. Scoliosis since a child. And I kind of sort of try to be a golfer sometimes. I mean, since I hurt or tweaked my back again in September, I, you know, it's now February. I haven't been out on the course again at all because I am feeling better. And now I'm almost scared to go toward that. Mm -hmm. I know. And John's going to be like, all right, Amy, the weather's good. (laughs) Well, in Cabo, I'm going to be like, you're not going without me. (laughs) So so here's a, here's a perfect example of where you should come see me for a couple of visits with the goal to test it before you get into that situation where you're there on a vacation. Well, pull and, out your phone because that would be next week then. That's awesome. So what about, what you know, like, um, I'm just thinking about, I'm going to call them sort of like fitness boot camps. You know, you kind of sign up for the 21 day this or the 60 day that or whatever. I mean, is that okay? Or checked out first? Or what do you say to those sorts of things? You know, I'm for anything that gets anybody moving consistently, you know, like, like people will come ask me like, Hey, what do you think about CrossFit? I'm like, you know, I don't know much about CrossFit. I've never been in a CrossFit box, but the community support that they provide in there, it seems pretty cool. There's a family feel to it that I don't know it. I don't, I've don't. i never experienced it, but I think it's great. Um, do I love everything that people do in CrossFit as far as what they're doing to their body? No. But that, I, do I love everything that people do in yoga to, for their body? No, not at all. Um, so... And we teach Pilates and not everything in Pilates is functional either. Bingo. Like, I mean, I'll give you yeah. a perfect example. The, the hundred is like the first Pilates exercise is taught in most Pilates classes across the world. And, and I just, we rarely teach it's it. Very rarely um, even taught in our studio. We, we teach stuff to, to 
create the same effect that it's going to do, but without the strain and stress. Now, someone say, oh, you should be able to do it without the strain and stress. Well, not everybody can. Exactly. My neck exactly. hurts every time. And I've, exactly. I've been, exactly. I'm strong and my neck hurts. Yes. If I exactly. Do it, so. Exactly. So, so I, I'm for any boot camp. I'm for anything. Um, most boot camps and things are fairly, can be fairly aggressive. Um, so again, it's kind of the same advice. If you say, I'm going to sign up for this boot camp in two weeks, start doing something before that first day, two weeks from now. And if you need help with that, then get some help with that, you know. But again, if you have a history of, all right, here's a scenario. I have a history of doing a boot camp and getting back pain five days into it. Well, have a have a plan with your team. I lost track of my team earlier, right? So have your team where you work with someone leading up to it. And then when you know when you have an issue, you know who you're going to call on, see who's in your phone, who's ready to, to, to help you whenever you need it. Because when you are injured, when you're going through that, it's best to get treatment as soon as possible because it's much easier to help something right then and there than it is a month or two or six later. Is it like we should write an article about this too? I mean, this really is important. And as you are getting older people out there, think about things like this. I know it's been different for me. I mean, for example, when I say that day I tweaked my back in September, I was able to call Stephen and he came in to see me that day to help get me because I, I was really having a hard time even getting off. I had a hard time driving to see you even that day. It yep. was you get a little special treatment too. <laughs> I did. You, have that, you would probably do that for any of the patients you've had for over a decade. If you uh, knew yeah. they hurt you know, or whatever, and it's Friday afternoon, I know you would do that. That's, yeah. that's one of the great things about what I've built at my office is that the people that I see at this point, like they're really like a list of VIP people that, that come and go. And cause I haven't marketed, um, I haven't marketed to bring new people Amy in, loves to be a VIP. But, no, it's, <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's true. Like, like I haven't marketed to try to bring new people in to, to see me in two years because I've got staff that I've been trying to get busy. And by making that decision, I made the decision that like these people that know me, that call me and say, Hey, I want to get in. I want to see them immediately. And by not, and by not taking new patients, my schedule is not full like it was before I had staff. And I love that because I, my staff schedule is full and my schedule gets full on an as needed basis. So I've kind of allows you to take people like that because you know, you can get them. It if, does. You, if you're hurting and you get in immediately, it's much better. Your chances of getting better quicker are like just way. Well, so that was another tip right there. Mm-hmm. If you hurt, try to see someone as soon as possible exactly. instead of taking Tylenol or whatever and trying to, oh, this will go yeah. away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and some people like they talk about the concierge world of medicine and they say, oh, man, why would you pay for that? Well, everyone has paid me cash for the last five years. Now it's a part of my concierge world that I'm uh-huh. willing to take care of. My uh, my my dad paid an extra like three thousand dollars a month a year, excuse me, to be a part of this Medicare concierge payment. And by doing that, he had access to his doctor. He had access. He could text him and call him anytime, Saturdays, Sundays. Um, it was a scenario that like you get what you pay for, mm-hmm. and everyone everyone wants to like. I'm in pain now and they're reacting and they're calling everybody. Well, most people that are good and taking patient people and consistently, they got a wait list to get in. It's not so easy to get in to see someone today when you're injured today. And that's why I always like to say you build your team. It's not for right now. It's for when you need them. Um, and not everyone's willing to work that way, but that's when something you're gonna need them. that exact people are going to like, so but when you someone can calls even do that on Medicare, then that's accessible to a lot of people to yeah. build that sort of program in their lives. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's fun. Like someone call, uh, came in and saw me the other day and he's like, Oh man, I can't believe I, I was able to get in today when I called today. And I said, yeah, my that's, that's, I mean, I'm not trying to fill my schedule right now. Mm-hmm. I'm just available for the people that know me. If you call me in my office right now and said, Hey, I want to schedule an appointment for physical therapy. You're not getting on my schedule. But if you call me and say, "Hey, I'm I'm so and so," and I saw I, I saw Stephen yeah. I saw Stephen three months ago, I saw Stephen two years ago, I saw Stephen ten years ago, then it's a different scenario. I heard Stephen on the Inbibe Live Conversations podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. So one more- thing, one more thing I want to make sure we talk about, cause I know I won't call it your soapbox in a negative way, but I know one of the things you're passionate about Stephen is, and everyone has already heard that in this podcast is student athletes in general. You love working with student athletes. You were one yourself. You've worked with all of my kids. You have two young sons yourself. Um, I know you talk a lot about student athletes and the pros and cons of them specializing in one sport when they're very young. We talk a little about that. Uh, For sure. Yeah. No, I I definitely. (laughs) definitely Um, And and, and it comes out every year right around the Super Bowl, this information. Um, And I usually do a blog about it and I haven't done a blog about it, but I saw this information um, about a week ago, two weeks ago. And it was, it listed every quarterback that was in the playoffs from the NFL and every single quarterback played two sports in high school. Most of them played three and a couple of them played four. And so like, like Joe Burrow, for example, baseball, basketball, I'm sorry, football, basketball, and track, uh, Matthew Stafford, football, basketball, baseball, and track, um, Mahonis, um, Patrick Mahones, have you say his name? I can never say it right, but everybody knows who I'm talking about. Uh, he was a point guard on the basketball team. He was the center fielder on the baseball team, and he was the quarterback um, on the football team. And when you watch him play, he looks like a point guard. He looks like a center fielder, and he looks like a quarterback all combined in one, and that's what makes him special. Teams like uh, Georgia and Teams like LSU, and the only reason I'm saying them is because those, the, the, those are the only two teams <laughs> I pay attention to. But they don't. They don't. You should say UT for Amy. They yeah. don't. I don't. I don't know this, <laughs> if this is true for UT though. But the schools I just referenced, LSU and Georgia, they do not recruit a quarterback that only played quarterback. So if you went to high school and you only played football, you will not get looked at by some of the best programs in the country. So why Period. is that? Why? Why is right. this important? There we go. All right. So when you specialize in sports, well, and you, you basically end up doing one thing repeatedly over and over and over. Now, when I grew up, there was no specializing in anything. You play baseball in baseball season, you play basketball in basketball season, you play football in football season, and you know, maybe you played soccer, track, and other stuff too. But like there was a season for it, and you could not do it year round. It didn't exist. There was no travel ball. There was no daddy pays my bill, pays for me to play ball. None of that existed. So it was just you played on the team and you played in the city. So you didn't have that opportunity to like go from flag football year round or baseball year round. Just it didn't exist. Well, now it does. And it has for some time now. And it's a big money thing. And it's 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 a money thing. And it has none of the kids health. And, and, and it, there's no looking out for the kids. It's it's a lot of people making a lot of money off the of travel ball. And it really is upsetting because that is being pushed by those people, not necessarily the high school coaches. And so by the time you get to high school, if you've only been set up to be the quarterback, then you've overused your throwing shoulder already. You're done. You're never going to have the capacity to make it through high school if you've been playing since you're seven years old to be the next quarterback at the high school. Um, if you play basketball and football and baseball, you're probably going to be the pitcher on the baseball team, but that's a totally different motion than throwing a football. Um, and so it's the idea of always doing something different, which is cross training. It's the same idea as why we recommend someone to see us for Pilates and gyrotonic, but also go do a little bit of this, also go do a little bit of that. It's all about cross training. So if you only do one thing, your body gets used to it. You're more susceptible for injury. If you do multiple things, your like to play basketball, it's totally different skill, like muscular activation than being a wide receiver who's going to sprint for four seconds and then jog back to the line, to the huddle, walk out to his position, sprint for four seconds and do that over and over and over versus basketball. You just constantly move and run and jump. And so it's just two, truly two totally different worlds. And I can talk about basketball and baseball because that's what I played. And that's what I, I mean, I love those sports, but like, it doesn't matter what sport you're playing. It, you got to mix it up. So the kids today that only play basketball, only play football, they're going to, 
more than likely not have the durability to make it on the long haul. And so I always like to say, do you want to be the best freshman ever? Or do you want to be, do you want to actually make it to college? Because if you're the best freshman ever, you ain't going to make it to college. And I'm guessing it's more important when kids are younger because that's when everything's developing. For sure. For sure. Oh. And we, we, got, we got to pay attention to the growth plates and we got to pay attention mm-hmm. to things like that. Right. And a lot of people will say, oh, you can't do this and this because of the growth plates. And the growth plates are basically at the end of long bones. Right. This where it's allowing us to grow. And for boys, they're going to mature. Their growth plates are going to end around 14 to 20 because their maturity, their puberty levels vary a lot. For girls, they're gonna, their growth plates are going to be done around 16. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about weight training is bad for growth plates or can stunt those things. And that's completely false. That's been completely, completely debunked. So if someone's telling you don't train or don't do this because of my growth plates for my 10-year-old kid, there's no evidence that that sports or weight training or any of those things are going to hurt that. In fact, that's it's all good to do those things. But if you injure a growth plate, then then we got some we got some other trouble to deal with. So if someone back to injuries now, if someone injures their growth plate, they need treatment immediately because if they don't get treatment immediately, there's a chance they're gonna you know if they injure their break their femur and they're 12 years old and it doesn't at the growth plate and it stops growing, well, you know, four years later they may have a you know, two inch leg length discrepancy that will create a lot of problems versus getting that thing, those types of things addressed right or right away. A little tangent there, but just kind of going into some of the ideas and some of the questions and the things that come up whenever I'm talking with parents about, about training and injuries and, 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 and prevention and kind of all these same topics. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot. <laughs> I know. You asked for it, Amy. <laughs> I did. No, I mean, I think it's all good information because when we started talking about this, Cheryl, we were kind of talking about the kids. I think the topic came up with a friend or something like that asking, but then I said, you know what? My husband just tweaked his back playing golf at age 52 or 53, whatever he is. And is like, I'm lifting weights and I'm stretching several times a week and I'm doing all this other stuff. What happened? So, and we all have those friends. I mean, who, elbow playing tennis or whatever. And I don't know, at at certain points you think, am I ever going to be the same again? Or, you know, is it all over now? But the truth is you can, you can get to a point where you can do most of the things you want to do. Totally. Totally. Uh, Totally. But, But there has to be work and there has to be a commitment to, Listen to your body. Listen to your body. That's and, what we try and, to teach people. And, and not over, not, not, not push just because you need to push, push when your body's allowing you to push. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's where, again, some of the boot camps and those things can be problematic because people are going to be listening to the person half their age, motivating them. No pain, no gain. Or yeah. Exactly. Where that now, pain now, pain. now, no pain, no gain is one of the, the dumbest things that, that's <laughs> ever come out of um, like the, the, like, phrases um and like oh pain is just like like what they say what is it what they say um oh gosh well, um, the thing about you just mentally have to overcome it or something like that pain yeah. is something leaving your body i can't remember but it, it, it's it's like Weakness. it's like, a, it's like a macho. your body yeah yeah it's like it's a, it's a machoism that i, I don't yeah. agree with oh here comes stella um, <laughs> um, in case you hear a pig in the background there's our pig <laughs> so, but I, I think no pain, no gain is, is where a lot of people do get hurt. And, um, and especially people our age, we've been kind of, um, that's a big part of our mentality. Whereas like kids today, um, you know, they're, 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 it's, it's a different, there's, there's different acceptances and different things. Like, you know, like when I was a kid, had you ever heard of a sports psychologist? No way. But now, like sports psychology is one of the most important things to allow these kids that are great athletes, like not lose their stuff. You know, uh, there's been a couple of kids that have come to LSU that like they never they never made it. They were five star, the best of this of blah, blah, blah. But they never made it because they're mine. And they've been told they were special since they were five years old because they were such good. They were so good at what they did. And then they didn't know how to handle that pressure, that, that, that expectation. And again, when we were that age, like 
there was nobody to talk to about those things. And now there's, there's so many programs and there's so many things. And still with all that stuff, there's still great athletes that, are, that never get a shot because of, um, because of it. So your mindset's a huge piece of the pie. One of the biggest pieces of the pie and, um, and no pain, no gain is this exact reason why people don't come see people like me when they should. So I think we've heard the importance of putting a team together, listening to your body and balancing it all out. That's yeah. right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And and I love what I do, but at the same time, it doesn't mean you have to like come do what I do to stay active and fit. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, like you're, you're a long-term client of ours and come do our, our training sessions with Cheryl, but you just mentioned a lot of the other stuff you did too. Right. And so there's that balance, right? Like we, we, and we want that. Um, we want people to do that, but we also want them to take the awareness that we're teaching them and apply it to the training from the video, the on videos on demand uh, for my kids. Apply it to their job. For, apply it to whatever that's right. So, so when, when I'm working with my 12 year old, when I'm working on this swing right now, like I'm like, okay, exhale as you swing the bat. Use your core. Like you're in my, our Pilates class. Use that core when you swing the bat. Don't just use your arms. You come from a different place. And it only takes him a second to find it. But if I don't tell him that, he'll never find it. And I know his coach isn't going to tell him that quite from the same way. So, again, it's a matter of, like, can you take – and then that can be a patient, teaching them how to get something out of the – out of the, Oh, <laughs> the, sorry. Stella. Stella. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it could be teaching someone to swing the bat or throw the ball while they exhale and protect their body, or it could be teaching someone to get something out of the dishwasher or right. out of the laundry. And so again, I remember it's like, one of my first lessons was an engage your core when you're pushing the grocery cart. Yes. And yeah. I still think of that and do that when I'm in the grocery yeah. store. Yeah. Hey, it's working. And, and again, that, <laughs> that's just one of those like random statements that I said when we met probably 12 years ago or 13 years ago that you're still thinking about and is still in your mind. Do you think I remember telling you that? No. Cause I, I tell, I Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, why I, that's, that's why I don't remember. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Cheryl. She just, like, <laughs> um, that, that was, was me. me. <laughs> well, so thank you, Stephen, for joining us again, our VIP guest here. No Stephen Dunn. And Stephen, you can go to Core Therapy and Pilates website, which we'll link, and your YouTube channel actually has a lot of videos giving a lot of these tips, sometimes even showing specific movement. And you guys have put a lot of this information also into the book you wrote also, and the title of it is Train the Brain. Uh, it's retrain the brain to solve back pain. Yeah. And so it even has photos of some of the exercises in, in there too. So check all of that out. Yes. Yes. And, and most importantly, just um, pay attention, listen, and, and don't let like, don't let what the, the 25 year old on social media is doing dictating what you're doing when you're yeah. 50 right. and, 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 or don't let the 15 year old kid, let LeBron James dictate what he's doing on social media. You know, now granted LeBron James does do Pilates. I will get that plug. So, <laughs> so he, he, he does Pilates. But and, again, and he probably spends eight hours a day working exactly. on it's, physical. It's, one, it's yeah. one of the 10 things he does that yeah. we to, to like be a part of his, his routine. So I shouldn't bust his chops. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. If you yes. like what you heard here, also check us out on InVibeLife.com. Go to our YouTube channel at Invibe Life, and um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining our conversation today. For more information or to learn more about InVibe Life, we hope you'll visit us at www.invibelife.com. You can find links and show notes for this episode on our podcast page. Please like, follow, and leave a review for our podcast. We hope that you will listen again soon.